Well, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. He is worthy of praise. He is an awesome Father. Uh, I tell you, I, uh, I think when we move from that position of knowing that He is a true Father, um, and I, I think that the thing is pretty cool, like unless you've ever been a father, and I'm not talking about, you know, but if you've ever been a father where you desire your children to become the reality of their intended purpose and design, that this is exactly what God did when he created mankind. And I I love it when it says that he was the begotten or the fathered son. And, um, you know, it's more than just taking thought, right? It's just more than just the knowledge all those things are vitally important. Like, uh, you, you, you better know, this is why Paul said, he said, like, I didn't hold anything back from you. I gave it all to you. And um, the reason God wants us to know everything is because he is everything. And you know what's really cool is not one person can learn it all by themselves and that's why he has a body that we can learn from one another and then the whole body will know because it knows the head yeah it's pretty cool it's pretty simple it's pretty awesome so you're gonna have to give me a second uh we sang a song the first song, and it, it, uh, I literally just read this verse last night, and I did not, um, I, I did not plan on reading it, but I didn't even plan on reading it until we uh, started here. But um, uh, let, turn, turn with me to Psalms 19. Oh, jeez. See, this is why I shouldn't do this, because you just don't know where to start then. And All right, we're just going to start at verse 1. So, like, I'm already off the rails. So here we go, verse 1. To the chief musician, Jesus, right, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God. Oh, hallelujah. And the firmament show his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. And day and night, they just keep talking about God. That's all they do. Well, I don't ever hear it. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Without a sound, without a word, without a voice being heard. God is talking. I said this on Sunday, and I'm going to stand by it because it's, like, I I wrote this down. Like, like Steve, Steve said this after church, and because, like, we've said it so many times, but when he said it at the moment... I, like it's really struck a chord in me, and and so I, I wrote it down. Um, let me see if I could. Uh, well, then I, I rewrote what I wanted to say because I, I I said like in the outer court, the reason I don't care how much knowledge people have, if they're viewing it by the outer court or the natural light or natural realm. It's still limited. It's under the sun. Middle court, man-made light, according to a prescription or a requirement by God. You must come with your hands full. Like people come to church empty, They wonder why there's no light in their life. 
You can't come just with a thought. You have to come with Jesus. Well, I have Jesus. Like proof is in the pudding. And then we talked about it like in the most holy place. The illumination is God. And Steve said after, he goes like, no shadows, right? And I'm like, right, exactly. I mean, all my life I grew up understanding and knowing in the most holy place is God. No man. No natural light. No preparation by man. Nothing produced. It's all God. So I wrote this down. Lights out on the natural, outer court. And man-made middle court light lights out. It won't work where we're going. Why? Like, see, I already am sidetracked, but like, no voice. But he's talking. I don't hear it. How are you looking at it? Where is your light coming from? There are no shadows or types. Can I add something to it I didn't write down? Or proverbs. Why do you talk to them in parables? No light. From the most holy place. They need light from the natural realm. See, in the, in the second court, man produces light by the candlestick, by putting the oil in, lighting the fire. All kinds of types and shadows in there. Parables. Things we can relate to. But where God is taking in people is beyond that. Well, I don't want to go there. You don't have to. Our Father. This is who He is. Which are in the realm of the Spirit. Holy is your name. Your nature. Your character. Everything about you is holy. Everything. All right, here we go. Like, seriously... Without a word, right? Without a word. Verse 5, which is a bridegroom. Right? Oh, wait. <laughs> wait, sorry. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun or a replacement. Remember what the book of Ecclesiastes says? Everything is under the sun. The whole book of Ecclesiastes is all about what's under the sun. But remember when Paul was on the road to Damascus, what did he see? He saw a light above the sun. Greater. I I, I swear this is what most of us need. No, even just a glimpse of it. Been living in the types and shadows for way too long, and it, and, it, and it lacks in a realm of relationship with God and His people. Verse 5, which is, which is, as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. What a heavenly home God has set for the sun, shining in the superdome of the sky, seeing how he leaves the celestial chamber each morning, radiant as a bridegroom, ready for his wedding, like a day-breaking champion, eager to run the course. His going forth is from the end of heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Here we go. The law of the Lord, or the word of the Lord, is perfect. Converting the soul. (laughs) 
This is why salvation is what? What is it? Progressive. Well, I got saved. Step one. The Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword cutting asunder, dividing. Multiple ways to look at it. The soul from the spirit or the thing that separates the soul from the spirit. What is the soul? It's the mind the will and emotions. Do you know you can love Jesus in a 30-fold realm and still do whatever you want? And still believe whatever you're doing is godly. This is why James wrote a double-minded person is what? Unstable in, in what? All your ways. It's because he doesn't look at the individual transgressions. He looks at the path, the historical path and pattern of a life. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. What does it do? It makes the wise or making wise the simple, I'm sorry. Making wise the, uh, making wise the simple, all right? And there's a reason why I, wanted, uh, I was reading that verse last night, and that, that is because we were talking about, we've been talking about, search for what? Hidden treasures, wisdom. Wisdom. There's a lot of stuff we don't know yet. I don't mean know about. I mean really experience. No, really experience. Most folks, honest to God truth, in Christianity, as long as they have money in their pockets and things are going the way they would like to a certain extent, they only give God credit for the natural light. That's all they can do. When God's looking for a people who will worship Him in spirit and truth, it becomes an expression. Hey, Paul, I think you're crazy. You're mad. Something's wrong with you. You know, of all the people that we read in the Bible, Paul said he was caught up into what heaven? The third. I don't read about any other person caught up into that dimension. And he said, I saw things that were outside of the first two dimensions that I'm used to walking in. (laughs) You know, I I have to tell you this. I think this is pretty good. I was listening to uh, uh, Ed the other day from his Sunday school, and I I think he was reading one of Brother Varner's present truth books. But like this was this, this was really good. Like I really liked it because I think it's really relatable. And he said, you know, he, I don't know if you use the scripture, like, because, like, when I'm riding my bike, you know, I, I, I kind of, like, I'm in and out, you know. <laughs> like, so, anyway, I, I heard him say, you know, you, he used the scripture about um, uh, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. And that we can't have the world in us. And he said it was like, he was reading Brother Byron's book, and I don't know what book, but he said, like, a Christian has to be like a ship floating on the water. And the water being the world. 
But if the ship starts taking on water, the world, it will eventually sink. He said it will start sinking, but I say this. It will eventually. Our problem is, is we think because there's no immediate retribution to our actions, Ain't done a thing wrong. God must be approving everything because look at how I'm doing. We should have learned that lesson from Samuel. He said, Samuel, I don't look on the outside. I look on the inside. And you know what made David different than all of his brothers? He was out doing the father's business. Wasn't even invited to the feast. Was left out. Best place to be. In the father's scope. So where does wisdom come from? Whence then cometh wisdom, and where is the place of understanding? And we've already established it's the most holy place. And I I, I wrote this down because of, uh, and I I read this the other day, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He already opened the way for us. And Hebrews 10.20 says it like this. It says, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. I wrote this down. A people will follow him all the way in to the most holy place. You and I must go through the veil of our flesh. When he made a way, what, he, what it's really trying to tell you and I is this. He showed us how it is done. Revelation. Don't turn there. Revelation 12, 11 says, And they have conquered him. Who? The serpent. I don't want to get in any debate with people over the, over the serpent. Like, we know he, he, he <whistles> slithered on the ground in Genesis chapter 3, but by the time you get to Revelation 12, he's walking to and fro. He's gained power and legs and everything else. How did he do it? Carnality. Natural man. What does he eat? He feeds on the dust. By the way, what does a Philistine mean? Rolling in the dust. Carnal mind. It pictures the natural mind. They have conquered him. How did they do it? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. In other words, their actions. Oh no, let me rephrase. The word became flesh. I'll read the rest of the verse and it will tell you how it was done. For they love not their lives, even unto death. Jesus wasn't afraid to die. Why? He knew what the outcome was. Well, that was Jesus. Well, where's he living now? Where are you living? 
Are you living in him? Is he living in you? He already opened the way. He is the forerunner. He has showed us how it's done through the veil of the flesh. So everybody says, well, he ripped the veil from top to bottom. Yeah, in, a, in an old church, an old tabernacle. But the writer to the Hebrews said, the true veil, the thing that separates you and I from God is the veil of our natural flesh. I don't mean this body right here, even though it has its issues too, because I, I, this is why like, what Paul wrote to the Philippian church. He says he'll even change this vile body. Everybody wants to save this body. It's vile. It's corrupt. It's, it, it's not incorruptible, and it's not immortal. It must put it on. How do you do that? Through the veil of the flesh the carnal mind, the Word of God. You know, this is what's really cool. You know, uh, uh, I, I said this just the other day about in Ephesians 5, the Word of God. What, what will it do? By the washing of the water of the Word. If we went to the prophet Malachi, he says he's going to clean you up with fire and with fuller soap. A bar of soap in the hand. Fivefold ministry, working, cleaning, cleansing, declaring the word. So it cleans us. You know, the thing about Job, you know it's really cool? If you read Job 28, this is what it says. He says, on top of the earth, guess what you grow? Bread. And guess what do you do? You eat it. But under the earth, what's under the earth? He said fire. To turn all the jewels into jewels. What's inside? A cleansing fire to convert everything, transform into what God has determined. Yeah. This is our father. No, this is our dad. He's the king. He has no enemies. Zero. Like when there was nothing, there was God. And what's really cool, because one of the things that Paul saw when he was caught up in the third heavens, he saw that you and I were in him. A father desiring to birth a son that would come forth into the earth and be exactly like in his image and after his likeness. A nature and a character with no equal. There's no one like you, God. Yes, there is. You know, I, I, was, I was thinking about this. You know, I remember, like, this was like uh, uh, about 1985, I would think, 1985, 1986. Like, only Sherry was around besides me, but none of the rest of you were. And I remember them kids, they, like, I, I, I started teaching 10-year-olds in the Sunday school. And the first question they asked me was this. They said, well, it, and I, saw, I was teaching on that Jesus was God in the flesh, which, like, was, like, groundbreaking for some people. Like, in our circles, it wasn't. But for most churches, they, they didn't know that much about it. And this is what they, the first question they asked me. If Jesus was God in the flesh, why did he pray to himself? Ten-year-olds asking me that question. And I'm only like 24. The only thing they could ever see, and this is what immaturity does, is sees things from a natural point of view. I've been looking at wisdom, you know, looking at wisdom. Why is it called she in the Old Testament? But in the New Testament, it's called Jesus, the Christ. Not just the head, but its head and body is the wisdom of God. And then all of a sudden I realize that in Christ, not male or female, it's irrelevant. Wisdom 
is the Christ. I guarantee you, overwhelmingly, even if we know and understand, 99.9% of the people still live by a gender mentality. It comes out all the time. It's unconscious biasness. It's not Christ. It's man. And he says to seek wisdom. Search for it like a hidden treasure. Jesus. No, Jesus. No, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. I, I, I don't mean to mess you up, but I'm going to tell you, in the simplest form, Jesus was made unto us. Wisdom. And then all of a sudden, I'm going to fall down. The two became one. Not by my doing, by his. And all I have to do is agree with him. Walk with him. Know him. And that everything he has purchased will become exactly what he determined. Like, I'm telling you, God was not tripped up when Adam and Eve fell. God had, like, we can't comprehend this. The closest I can come, I gave you my story. Two years trying to figure it all out. Well, everything, I, that's all God ever did. He had it all planned out in his mind. Now, I'm going to mess you up. He didn't have a body. He didn't have a head. He didn't look like a man. He didn't look like a woman. He is a spirit. And you know what's so cool about that, Beck? That his life became light. <laughs> it became visible. And of all the objects that he created, seen and unseen, right? There's music in this room. There's light in this room that you can't see with your natural light eye. Because God is trying to get you and I to understand that his life is the light. Help us, Jesus. Jesus Christ is wisdom. The wisdom of God is corporate and many-sided. It's variegated. Many members, one body. All right, all right. I'm going to end here. The book of Hebrews, it's a pretty cool book. I love the book. It's a book for overcomers. It says it in the name. Everybody remember this? What's your occupation? Jonah replied, I am a Hebrew. It literally means to cross over. You ready for this? Like we will quote this in Christianity. I pass from uh, darkness to light. I pass from death to life. You know what? He wants to do that in all three dimensions of our lives because God lives in a three-room house. Three rooms. Spirit, soul, and our bodies. 
And when Jesus broke through, rendered the flesh inoperable. Oh, it's a spirit. He says, I'll show you. Just give me some food. I'll eat it. Right? Isn't this true? John, or in the book of John, when he was at the well with the woman, and they, they're like, he said, they're like, hey, what's he doing? What's he doing? And he says, hey, I have meat food. Which you don't know anything about. And all they could see was the natural light of him talking to a woman and who got him dinner from some other place. I thought he sent us to get it. The realm of the spirit of a living God is so much outside the scope of a natural mindset. We need to change. Proverbs says this, I have come all the way around. Wisdom calls to the simple. And David wrote to the chief musician that the voice of God is always calling, speaking, to convert the soul and to make wise the simple. Do you realize just having a good job, making money, and doing your, building your own life is a simple life? It's elementary. The first kind of question would be, well, shouldn't we do that? Elementary. Doesn't stop death, does it? Doesn't stop life, human life. But what God is after is eternal life. Divine life. A life that is lit up. Bigger or better, greater than the sun. He called us for that. He chose us in himself. Making wise the simple. It stands at the top of the city and calls out to us to convert us completely over to be one in Him. Amen.